So something you already forgot to mention is that we have to acknowledge our major funders of this uh, school. And these are two FP7 grants we have. One is my mom ran by Janine. She was generous in supporting the school. And the other one is Integra Life, which is a, a regional network project which I coordinate, which is also funding a large part of this. So uh, thank you to them. And I hope we'll get more grants and then we'll have more of these schools. So this is actually what I'm doing most of the time now. I'm writing grants. We have a deadline in a little bit more than two weeks. So this is why I won't be here a lot. So, but then we'll have a next school. So I still consider myself to be relatively young, but actually I'm one of the dinosaurs of glycoscience. My first glycobiology paper was published nearly 25 years ago. And the glycoscience has changed a lot in the last 25 years. And uh, a lot of data you will be working with are the glycan data. So in this lecture and the next lecture I will give in two days, I will tell you a little bit about glycoscience because unfortunately glycoscience is not being taught at undergraduate, not even at postgraduate levels adequately. You might have a little bit of glycoscience, but definitely not enough. So I will start with a typical picture you have all seen before. This is a cell membrane, the way you see it in the books. There is a tiny little problem with this picture. It's wrong. The wrong part are the glycans. You can see here that there are tiny little hexagons added to proteins and lipids on this figure. And you can assume that somebody during the revision of the figure said, oh, where are the glycans to so add some little hexagons? Glycans do not look like that. When you look under the microscope, under the electron microscope, this is a cell membrane. This tiny little white part that's the lipid bilayer. And this thick black coating, these are the glycans. So our cells are coated in glycans. Glycans can be considered as a coating we wear. You can go on a beach in a bikini, or you can go skiing in a, your skiing outfit. And you will be a very different person in the bikini and in your skiing jacket. And if you go in a bikini skiing, you'll be in trouble. If you go in a skiing jacket to the beach, you'll be in trouble again. And the same thing is happening to us. So if glycans are different, our cells, our proteins are presented in a different way and they act differently. So when we think about proteins, and proteins do the majority of the jobs in our body, nearly all proteins invented after the appearance of multicellular life are glycoproteins. So they're composed of polypeptide part and of a glycan part. And both parts participate in a function. And I like to make analogy with this fly in the top right corner. So if you want to study a fly, it's difficult because it can fly away. So if you cut off its wings, it's much easier to study. This is the same things people do to proteins. They cut off the glycans and then they study the protein. And actually, you can do a lot of good science on a fly without its wings. You can study its legs, you can study its eyes, you can even study a cognition of a fly. But you will never see a fly flying. And this is the same thing which is happening in science now. People are studying proteins a lot. They're doing a lot of good science on proteins. But they are missing this glycan part. They're ignoring it. And this is why they're missing a big part of biology. So why? Why is the majority of scientists ignoring glycans? Is there a reason why they do it? And actually, there is a very simple reason. It is very difficult to study glycans. So contrary to proteins in DNA, which are linear molecules, you can have a sequence of letters, and you know the full chemical structure, both DNA and proteins. You cannot do it for glycans. Glycans are nonlinear, they're branched, they have different components which can be linked in a different way. So you have a huge structural complexity, which is very difficult to study chemically. So analytics of glycans is very complex. Also, 
there are at least 2,000 different blocks of glycans which are being added to polypeptide backbones. So when you think about nucleic acids, which have four nucleotides, proteins, which have 20 amino acids, then you come to glycoproteins and you add more than 2,000 different glycan blocks to those proteins. And then you come to the complexity of glycoproteome, which is the set of all glycoproteins in the body, which is several orders of magnitude more complex than the proteome. So we have something like 20,000 genes, between 100 and 150,000 proteins, and between 10 and 100 million different glycoproteins. So the level of complexity is enormous. To make things even worse, there is no genetic template. Nowadays, people actually don't sequence proteins. They sequence tiny little bits of proteins going to database, look at the gene, and translate it into protein. So most of our structural information is based on DNA sequence. For glycans, there is no direct genetic template. So we know that for each protein, there is a gene which is being transcribed into RNA, which is then being translated into protein. Glycans do not have their genes. We have genes for a number of different proteins which interact together to make a glycan. So glycan is the result of a complex dynamic network composed of hundreds of different genes which interact, which act together, which respond to the environment, and in this complex metabolic pathway, they finally result in some kind of a structure which is then performing a function. So this is really difficult to study. Actually, for decades, people were thinking that glycans are some kind of a random product, so that any glycan on a given site on a protein will do its function. But this is not so. And fortunately, two years ago, there was a large report published and endorsed by the US National Academies, which clearly stated glycans are directly involved in the pathophysiology of every major disease. This is a statement endorsed by the US National Academies. <clears throat> they also said additional knowledge from glycoscience will be needed to realize the goals of personalized medicine and to take advantage of the substantial investments in human genome and protein research and its impact on human health. So more or less, US National Academies concluded you should be studying glycans. You shouldn't be ignoring glycans. And actually, you here are one of the few groups in the world which will have access to the largest pool of glycan data there is. And you will be able to play with glycans and get some more information about their importance in disease. So what do glycans do? <clears throat> to our current knowledge, there are four principal modes of action what glycans do. One, they can be ligands for specific glycoreceptors called lectins. They have a glycan structure, you have a protein structure, they bind together. There is a number of examples how this function in an organism, for example, selectins, attachment of pathogens, I will come back to that. Second option is that by putting different glycans to the same site of the same protein, the process we call alternative glycosylation, this will alter membrane dynamics of a different receptors. So everything on a membrane is happening in a dynamic interaction between environment and a membrane. And whether the, the receptor is on a membrane or not changes a lot. And glycans appear to be important in this process. Third option is by putting different glycans to the same polypeptide, you actually change the conformation of this protein. So the protein will be very different depending on the glycan that is attached. So by alternative glycosylation, you model a structure of a protein and then it will bind to different receptors. And the fourth example is glycosylation as a regulatory modification where addition or removal of a glycan will have some kind of a specific function. So I will go slowly through all these four examples just to show you how it could work. 
First thing, glycan as the ligand for some kind of receptors. Believe it or not, nearly all pathogens, viruses, bacteria, fungi, different cells, they actually bind to glycans. They do not bind to proteins initially. And this is logical because if you remember this figure under the microscope, this thick black coating on the surface of a cell, these are glycans. And everything coming from outside has to attach to these glycans. You may remember the bird flu, which was a big thing a few years ago. The only difference between the, in the recognition between the bird flu and the human flu is one little difference in the glycans. And you can actually change only two amino acids and make it bind to human glycans, and then it, this bird flu, flu would infect humans. And this is actually happening regularly. So anything happening on a cell surface, it's the glycan-protein interaction, and then it comes down to the protein-protein interaction, the second step. This is something all the pathogens invented, but this is also something we are using in our normal physiology. For example, there is a group of proteins called selectins, and selectins home lymphocytes to the site of uh, leukocytes to the site of inflammation. So what is inflammation? There is something wrong in our body. Bacteria, uh, tissue damage, cells are in panic, they release cytokines saying there is something wrong, there is something wrong, help me. But the bloodstream is extremely busy thing. When you think about a blood cell passing through the capillary, it's very much similar to the Formula One cars racing around the racing track. The speed compared to the size of a cell is enormous. If the cell would just stop, it's the same thing if you hit in a, in a brick wall with a car. It will just smash. So, so the cell cannot stop. Cell has to slow down, then it can stop. If there is inflammation to the complex network of signals, glycan structures on the surface of endothelium will change. New glycans will appear, which are kind of a red flag saying there is something wrong happening here. Then selectins bind to these glycan structures. They slow down because it's relatively complex, but in general, glycan protein interactions are not of a very strong avidity. So this is not strong binding. Multimeric binding is necessary for specificity. So they bind, but then they let go, and they start to roll on the endothelium. They slow down, and then in the second step, there are protein-protein interactions, exterization, and the neutrophils come in the tissue and kill everything what is there. So this same principle of glycan protein recognition is being used by all the different microorganisms, but a lot, but, but, but also with all the different cells in our organism. Cell, selectins are just one of examples. So the second mode of action, this is uh, alternative glycosylation, which will then alter membrane dynamics. And something we know now is that virtually all membrane receptors are glycosylated. And for the majority of them, it has been demonstrated that the glycosylation is necessary for their proper manifestation on a membrane. But the very interesting thing here is that at this point, at the point of glycosylation of membrane receptors, you have interaction between genetics, which is actually our past memory of environmental factors affecting us through the millions of years, and the current environment. Because to glycosylate protein, you need all the enzymes which are in the pathway. So all these genes have to be expressed. All these proteins have to be put on the right place in the cell. But also, you need a substrate. You need activated sugar nucleotides. And these sugar nucleotides are heavily affected by the hexosamine pathway, which is the main energy pathway of the cell. So things happening at this very moment the amount of energy, the amount of uh, building blocks, and the things which happened through millions of years, including the few years of our own development, which is being encoded in epigenetic regulation of these genes, integrate together, decide which type of a glycan will be on the cell surface, which then integrates into the half-life of a protein 
on the cell surface, its activity, and everything else. And all the hormone receptors, all the growth factor receptors, are being regulated in that way. For example, if you have a mutation or a polymorphism, which is affecting one of these genes, and this here is a GNT4A, which is one of the glycosyl transferases, if this is not functional, then you will have a different glycans on a cell membrane, and then the presentation of this protein on a cell membrane will be different. The half-life will be different. But the very similar thing you can achieve by changing the concentration of the UDP gluconac, which is activated sugar nucleotide being used to glycosylate proteins. So this is the presentation of a protein on a membrane compared to the concentration of UDP gluconac. So these two things come together and integrate into a complex living system and enables us to function in the way we function. Third example is alternative glycosylation of a protein, which will modulate its structure, and then this glycan protein unit will bind to a specific receptors. And one of the best examples we know is immunoglobulin G. Immunoglobulin G or IgG is one of the main weapons we have in our arsenal. It's binding to different microorganisms, pathogens, toxins, tumors, whatever, and then it's trying to eliminate them. Immunoglobulin G has so-called FAB part, which is fragment antigen binding, which is being selected during the early life to have a so-called hypervariable region, and then you will have a peptide sequence which will bind to almost anything. And then later in a lifetime, when you meet this antigen, this clone will propagate and you will have antibodies against this foreign pathogen. But just binding to a pathogen is not enough. You have to activate some kind of effector functions, which will then either kill or eliminate or do whatever else to this pathogen. And these effector functions are regulated by the so-called FC domain, which is a conserved sequence. So every antibody will have the same FC, more or less. Most of the antibodies will have the same FC domain. FAB will be very different. And this FC domain will determine to which receptors will the antibody bind and decide which immune mechanisms will be activated. And this FC domain is heavily affected by a glycan, which is being located here in this cleft between the two polypeptides. And depending on the type of a glycan that is being added, antibody can be pro-inflammatory or even anti-inflammatory. It can activate antibody-dependent cell or cytotoxicity, or it can even activate tolerance. So depending on which sugar you put on antibody, you're deciding the function of this antibody. And this sugar is not being defined by a gene. It's being defined by a complex interaction of hundreds of genes, and this decision is being made actually late in life. So this is a very powerful tool, how we can make our antibodies efficient antimicrobial and anti-tumor agents. And I will talk more about this in my lecture in two days. And the fourth principal mode of action is glycosylation is the regulatory, regulatory modification. You have all heard for phosphorylation. In our basic biochemistry courses, we learned about uh, glycogen, its synthesis, all the phosphatases and kinases which are involved. And we know that by addition of a phosphate group to a specific OH on serine, threonine, or some other amino acids, you will change the conformation of a protein and change its activity. But most of you were not taught that nearly all sites which can be phosphorylated can also be modified by the addition of the o gluconac single monosaccharide, which is being added to the same site. But the functional consequences are very different. Because when you add a phosphate group, you're adding charges, and these charges significantly modify the structure of a protein. While if you add just an o gluconac this is a small hydrophilic molecule. It just flies in a water around the protein and does not change the conformation. So adding o gluconac is a kind of a master switch for phosphorylation. If there is O-gluconac, you cannot put the phosphate anymore. 
So first you have to remove the oglock nut and then you can put the phosphate. So it's kind of a master switch. You just put it on and then all the kinases and phosphatases, they cannot do anything. And this is the essential mechanism. If you kill, kill oglock nut transferase, it's lethal at the level of a single cell. So I come back to this key policy paper published two years, years ago in the US. Interestingly, we published something very similar 10 years ago in Europe, but didn't have a major effect. But this policy paper published by the US National Academies actually did have a major effect. And uh, many, many people now start to study glycans. They take some samples, they measure some glycans, and they, they get something like this. This is one of our experiments, actually. Then you see patient control, and then you see some kind of difference. And unfortunately, many people publish it directly and say, wow, this is interesting. But the problem is, in this type of a study, you never know whether this is the predisposition, whether this is the consequence of a disease, or it could be just effect of therapy, because ill people are usually on some kind of drugs, and drugs can change glycans. Or this can be just incidental. And something we learned in the last 10 years is that we have to do large studies. Large studies which will both unify genetic, epigenetic, proteomic, glycoproteomic in information, put it all together, and then try to understand diseases. And one of the roots how we learned this was the big success of so-called GWAS, genome-wide association studies, which initiated the evolution in genetics something like seven years ago. And this enabled people to learn the links between genes and phenotypes relatively reliable. Igor will be talking much more about it in a few days, so I will not go into details. Just I will say that GWAS really initiated the revolution, and we learned that we have to do large studies. And then we decided, okay, let's do glycomics. And let's try to build glycomics into the GWAS success. And the problem here is that the glycomics is still globally deficient. There are only four labs in the world which ever published study on more than a thousand people. And actually all four of them in Europe, Americans don't have a single one. And only a few years ago, so this is seven years ago, <coughs> major journals were publishing glycomic papers on two or three patients. This is actually our paper, but it's published in collaboration with two top ex experts in the field at the time, Raymond Dweck and Pauline Rudd. And we had a single patient with sepsis, a single patient with acute pancreatitis, and we had three time points. So altogether, 10 samples. And Olga got a PhD out of that. And we published actually even more papers on that. So then, we really didn't need any statistics. You don't do statistics on one patient. It doesn't help you much. And then, only two years later, we published our first 1,000 people uh, paper. So we were the first to make this big step forward and move from 10 samples to 1,000 samples. And uh, we learned a lot out of that paper. But I think the most important lesson, at least I learned, was that uh, we need to learn more statistics. Because without the proper knowledge of statistics, you get some false uh, conclusions. And I will show you a few examples of the false conclusions we made. So we concluded that smoking affects glycosylation. We had 2,000 people. We looked at smoking. We looked at uh, glycans they have. And we found some actually relatively not so strong, but statistically significant associations. The only tiny little problems, problem with that is this was wrong. This was not the real association. What we had, we had two different islands. On one island, people were smoking more, don't know why. And we had a batch effect when we were measuring glycans. So whenever you measure something, you do have batch effects. So from unknown reason, one of the glycans was higher in, in one of the studies and not in the other study. And then when we piled it all together, we had a nice association. 
wrong. <coughs> but we also learned in this study that we can use glycans to uh, do a GWAS. So this is a typical Manhattan plot where you have all the SNPs which have been analyzed, presented by the color for different chromosomes. Then you have a p-value telling you how probable it is that this SNP is actually associated with a specific trait. And then you see that the majority of SNPs do not associate. And then you find a genetic loci with a number of SNPs which very high probability. And this is the, a real hit. So now we know this loci associates with a specific glycan. This was not a big actually discovery because we found out that the enzyme which is adding this glycan is associating with the glycans which have this sugar. That's logical. But that's good proof of principle. So what we can identify in this way, we can identify SNPs which will affect a specific glycan. So depending on the letter you have in your genome, your glycan will be lower or it will be higher. Then he said, oh, let's try to predict the glycan from the genome. And we did this. So we fitted the level of this glycan based on the available SNPs. And we actually measured the glycan in the same people and we said, wow, this is perfect. Very nice correlation. So we can predict glycan from the genome. No, we can't. This was a typical example of overfitting. If you have 300,000 random variables, you can fit anything into these 300,000 if you choose the right ones. So when we replicated this in the second population, then we realized this is, this is nothing. So we learned, okay, be careful about the batch effects. Be careful about uh, some what is real, what is not. You have to replicate things. So we did more experiments. This actually I showed on a number of lectures. This was an uh, experiment done on um, uh, E. coli infection in Hamburg. This, this is now seven or eight years ago. A number of young people died after eating some healthy food because of E. coli infection. And then we've had the people healthy, bloody diarrhea, but no infection, infection with this uh, bacteria. And then you see how different people are. We said, wow, we have a perfect biomarker. Again, wrong. I don't know why. But when we read, so actually I do know why. This was done on a very small sample. So we had something like 30 patients. So when you see a figure like this, you don't know whether this is a 30 people or 3,000 people. This was done on 30 people because we just got a sample from uh, Hamburg to test on that. Then we got another few hundred, we replicated everything and everything was lost. So unfortunately, glycans are so variable in the population that when you do a small pilot study, you can frequently get something like this. We also had another perfect biomarker. These are kids with allergies and kids, with, kids without allergies. You can assume that it's wrong again. We were not able to replicate it. So what, what did we learn? And I put here my momics. This, I think this was one of our key grants because this my momics grant is actually a grant about bioinformatics and statistics. We were some kind of uh, strangers there. When they, on the first meeting, I didn't understand the word they were telling. It was too complicated for me. I needed to get the translators. So we hired two PhD students who are now my translators. So I asked Fran and Lucia, Fran and Lucia help me, what are they talking about? But we did start to learn. So we did learn definitely that we need to do a large studies of the glycans. Because glycans are very variable among individuals. If you just randomly choose small groups, they will be different. You need to have large groups, you have to uh, replicate studies. And the problem is that there are many confounders the, learn I didn't know, the word I didn't know 10 years ago, and I learned how important it is that there are some other things which actually drive your associations. 
And then we also learned that we have to do proper randomization of samples. We used to have 100 patients, 100 controls, have them on two different plates, and they were usually all very different, many times because of the batch effects. So now we do randomized samples much better. So a few of these lessons we learned. So this is the variability of glycans in a general population. So this is the IgG glycum. These are the different structures you can find on the IgG glycum. And this is the, their levels in the population. And then you can see that this function here, which is actually very pro-inflammatory glycan, some people have 5% of the total glycum, the other people have 50% of the total glycum of this structure. So functionally, this is very important. But if you just randomly select few people, just because of the nature of variation, you may have a differences between your groups. So you have to have relatively large studies, and you also have to have replications. And this is something we should have learned from geneticists. Because even 10 years ago, there was a very nice paper published in Plus uh, Medicine showing that the majority of published studies actually are reporting false data, if they are from a small uh, study. So this is the odds ratio for a specific genetic loci and specific trait. Initial publication, replications, fact is being lost. Initial publication, replications. Initial publication, replications. All the published effects are being lost through replication, meaning they are not real. This type of papers are just burdening the literature. Because you are reading it, you think, oh, this is an interesting candidate. I want to do something else on that. And then you don't find anything. So replication and the sample size is very important. Also, with glycans, age is a big problem. For genetic studies, age does not matter. You just analyze the genome, and it's the same for the rest of your life. But glycans do change with age a lot. And actually, this figure is uh, in the same time showing how glycans change, but also it's showing how powerful large studies are. So these are four different populations. This is 1,000 people from Korchula Island. This is one beautiful island in Croatia. This is 2,000 people from Orkney Islands on north of Scotland. 2,000 twins from the uh, UK, and uh, also 1,000 people from a Vis Island, also a beautiful island, here a little bit further to the south. And then you see that the glycans change with age, but the, petter, uh, the blue are males, the red are females. And then you see that females have this strange, so these are four different glycans, have this strange bump, actually around the age of menopause. But this strange bump is appearing on a Croatian island, on Orkney island, on twins in UK, on another Croatian island. So this is the real bump. So the real biology is showing this type of behavior. Just we have to try to understand it. But now imagine that your patient is here and your control is only a few years older or younger. And you will have a significant difference just because of the age effect. And even if you try to do a linear co correction here, it will not help you much because this is not a linear problem. And age is actually a very big problem with glycans. This is something we did recently. This is the association of uh, glycans and uh, hypertension. Looks nearly perfect. Uh, Pre-hypertension, hypertension, you have a dose effect, you have a replication in the different structures, you have even a replications in the different populations. But the biggest problem here we have is that we cannot say whether this is a hypertension or age. Because when you correct this by age, you don't really see much. But then the question is, what is age? What kind of biological effect calendar has on us? Nothing. You can just swap calendar back and forth. So it's some kind of biological processes which happen with age, which are relevant. So maybe glycans are relevant for hypertension. 
but maybe they are not. And we don't know really how to work on that. Batch effects. So these are the nice little differences between some glycans we see only because of batch effects. So these are the ni different 96 well plates on which we analyze our samples. Okay, not everything is so bad. These are the minor glycans. Major glycans look much better. But also for the minor ones, if your patients are here and your controls are here, you see a very big difference. So what we do now, we take care to have properly randomized samples. I should have made put this photo with you randomizing samples there, Prano. I'll put it for the next talk. <laughs> because then you can use some kind of statistics and uh, correct for batch effects. So actually, statistics is at the moment the most powerful tool in biology. And people who do have a knowledge of biology or medicine and do know how to handle the data are the most precious members of any lab in the world. So if this is the direction you want to go, you will not have a problem finding a good job or even then trying to get bet better job every few years. So let me show you at the very end of my talk just one example what can be done with a good use of mathematics. So this was a nice experiment. 100 people undergoing heart surgery. We had samples before the surgery, day after surgery, three days after surgery. The same person. So there's no biological variation due to individual variability. We're just looking into differences within the same person. And this is now for just one time point, glycan which went down and glycan which went up. And this is a total plasma glycom. Total plasma glycom is when you take all the plasma proteins, remove the glycans, and then look for changes. And then you see in the plasma glycom that, that this glycan here is going down, actually it's going up in nearly everybody who undergo heart surgery. And this glycan here is going down. So there is a general pattern of changes which you can attribute to heart surgery. Then you look into the IgG glycom. So this is a single protein. We first take out the IgG from the plasma and then just look at the concentration of different glycans on the IgG. And if you remember what I told you earlier, these glycans are deciding whether IgG will activate ADCC, be pro-inflammatory, be anti-inflammatory. And then you have this beautiful carpet with the red and blue dots everywhere around. If you take an average for all the persons, there is no significant change. So not even a single glycan is changing with statistical significance in this population. But then again, this is the same person, two days apart, and you see a significant change. So there is something going on, but it is just not the same in every individual. Unfortunately, medicine is thinking that we are all the same. And we know that we are not. We look differently, we behave differently, we eat differently, and also we have different molecular mechanisms in our body. So, what we try to do here is to see whether we can identify groups of people which are similar and they change in a similar way after surgery. So this was done in collaboration with a group in Italy, also as a part of the Mimomics project. Frano was our representative there. And they did something they call B clustering. I have no idea what it is. For me, it's a black box. But it's a black box which separates people. So first, it groups glycans, which change in a similar way. And then they use these groups of glycans to group people. And then they grouped people into four groups, based on the way their glycans change. And one of these groups had more than doubled Euroscore index. Euroscore index is the major measure of uh, mortality risk after heart surgery. 
So this is something physicians calculate to see whether somebody is going to die after surgery or not. So this is not real mortality. These people didn't die. Fortunately, when you have 100 operations, nearly anybody dies. But this is the risk of dying. And some people with a specific change in glycans have more than double dura score index. So we went to look into these people to see what is happening with glycans. And then when you look, so this is this group with the double mortality index, the others are not. And then you see that most of these glycans go down and these are the pro-inflammatory glycans. While these glycans go up and these are the anti-inflammatory glycans. So the people who have higher risk of dying after heart surgery are actually activating anti-inflammatory mechanisms at the time of major inflammation. So this is a hypothesis, but what it seems to be that something went wrong with the signaling pathway deciding what to do with the IgG glycans and they actually activated the wrong response and this is making them more prone to dying. But you cannot conclude that on experiment on other people. Things have to be replicated. So we did another <coughs> ex experiment on a, this was an abdominal surgery with the, another group in Italy and then we see that actually the pattern of changes of glycans after heart surgery and abdominal surgery is more or less the same. So it seems that this kind of effect is something which we are really seeing. And at the very end, I would just like to say that this is uh, all being done in a very large collaborative uh, network. We do most of glycan analysis. There are also some other groups in Europe which does some of it. And we have samples coming from all around the world. So actually what I'm doing most of the time now is looking for some uh, clinicians doing interesting studies and telling them why don't you add glycans to your story. We have a nice group of young researchers in Zagreb, partly at University of Zagreb, partly in Genos. You can see most of them are smiling. I already told you Genos is the best place to work at university. So those guys who are not smiling uh, no, uh, Genos is the best place to work in industry in the world. So those guys who are not smiling, they work at a university. Yeah. <laughs> and we have a very generous support from EU. We have currently seven ongoing FP7 grants, which is enabling us to do all this. And if you're interested in glycans, a little bit more than a year from now, in the same place, a little bit more to the south, I'll be organizing Glyco 23. This is the largest glycan focused conference in the world. So the website is already on. So if you're interested, join us. And I thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to answer any question. <laughs> Questions? Well, you said that the age heavily impacts the glycosylation. Could you maybe then look at the immortal cells like the Malignant cells, they should have them different patterns. So anything yeah. affects the glycosylation. If you take a cell culture and you collect it in several passages, you'll have a different glycosylation. Yeah, yeah but then the, the immortal cells should have the different pattern of the glycosylation. If you show that bump like in mm -hmm. we females, then it shouldn't happen in immortal cells or they behave the same. Okay, so in cells, changes are generally due to environment. Yeah. So a little bit different media, a little bit more oxygen, different position in an incubator. So you don't have this regular type of changes. So what we are seeing here is mostly, I think, hormonal. So it is known that estrogen is affecting glycan. So this could be menopause. Actually, Lutzia was playing with that and I don't know where the story ended. Story ended in too many parallel projects. So <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. So, but the biggest problem with glycans is that the majority of questions have not been asked. So, um, actually, systematic studies have not been done in any, any model. I think the only IgG is the one where the studies have been done. So, there is a huge area to work in. I won't be around much, so ask me now. <laughs> so 
population studies of different uh, patterns of different population because you have these two islands. I don't know if there is something. So the problem we have with all the comparison of populations that we study them independently. So we cannot say whether this is a batch effect or whether this is a real biological difference. At the moment we are planning to do a global IgG population study. So we are collecting samples from all around the world from Papua New Guinea to Africa and uh, all the different uh, minority populations and then we'll do a properly randomized study to see what is actually the real population difference and what are the batch effects. Because the other problem we have is that we are constantly improving the methods we are using. So something we analyzed two years ago is not directly comparable to something we are analyzing now. So I cannot say anything about the real population differences because they, they could be just batch effects. So we are seeing them, but I'm not sure that really biologically important. But I would assume they would be. But we have to do this experiment. Um, so, how long, you mentioned high throughput glycomics, so how long does it take to measure uh, somebody's, uh, whatever, IgG level, for example? So, as I told you, methods are constantly improving. At the moment, uh, our working core is still UPLC. This is the ultra performance liquid chromatography, and the run is something like 32, 3, 4 minutes for a single person. Now, we are switching majority of IgG into mass spec where the run is uh, 12 minutes and we hope to move it, at least part of it, to Maldi where the run will be two seconds. So uh, we are now thinking about setting our next goal to do, uh, at the moment we are doing 20,000 samples a year approximately. We want to move now to studies of 50,000 samples and the next step would be 500,000 samples. So we, also, we already drafted some kind of a plan for 500,000 samples. So it's, it's moving forward, but it, 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 it's a lot of work. So how variable are glycans uh, in an individual? I mean, is it a bit like uh, if I've eaten uh, whatever, a Mars bar, then uh, it changes or is it, is nope. it more? Uh, so we did, with several, we did several studies to uh, check it. So for the plasma glycan, which we published a number of years ago, it's pretty much stable. So even after a year, more or less you are there where you were. Unless there is some kind of physiological event. Inflammation, disease, it will change it. So uh, heritability of the sum of the glycans is even 80%. So it's still heavily affected by your genome, but in a very complex way, but it's also very dynamic. So it's uh, Another reason why we have to do large studies because anybody with acute inflammation will have things changed. <laughs>